Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Inside 60 Days, the after show panel discussion that goes behind the scenes of the A&E TV show set in the Clark County Jail. That show is called 60 Days In, and it follows seven innocent people who volunteer to stay in the jail undercover as inmates for two months. In last night's episode, Barbara becomes the unofficial pod boss right before she's released from the jail. Isaiah sees things he never wanted to see, and an officer appears to get attacked in one of the cells at the end of the episode. To talk about that latest episode, I'm joined by Jennifer Ortiz, a criminal justice professor at IUS, and Clark County Jail Commander Major Sam Beard. My name is Elizabeth DePompe, and I'm the public safety reporter for the News and Tribune. Welcome. Thank you both for being here, and good to see you again. I want to go ahead and start with Barbara, who's the first to be released. Um, having made the whole 60 days. What do you make of how she kind of took control there at the end? She's very determined for everybody to get along and she stood up and, and spoke out to the inmates, um, called herself maybe the pod boss. What did you make of that? I don't necessarily think she was the pod boss. I think everybody saw her as like, as they called her, the pod mascot. And she was the non-dangerous, non-threatening one. So when she said something, people just were like, okay, let's just listen to her because Barbara's never mad, so if Barbara's upset about something, clearly something is wrong, and maybe she could be the mediator between all these other parties, which is exactly what she did. I wouldn't give her pod boss status, but she, I was really proud of her for, for, your, for being able to take command, try to bring some order to the chaos. Yeah, and a lot of people were saying on social media early on that there was no way Barbara would make it, and she did, and she seemed to really you know, step up to the challenge. Um, what did you think, Major Beard? Uh, she was a calm in the storm. You know, the storm started brewing. You started have, having all the factions arguing and, and bickering, and, and Barbara was just a, the motherly type, the calming type. I, I don't think she, like Miss Ortiz, she wasn't a pod boss. Amber Kinsey wouldn't allow that. I've known Amber for years. <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen on her watch. Barbara also says, I'm streetwise now. Do you think two months in jail makes you street smart? She, she may be a little more street smart than she was before, but that's not yeah. really saying much. I mean, she was yeah. very, you know, very sheltered, I, I think. And I wouldn't make her street smart. Maybe she knows how to, how to handle things in Clark County Jail. But yeah. I think if you put her in, you know, Kentucky State Prison, I'm not sure she's going to fare very well. Yeah. You go on. Street smart always changes. The streets are a lot different now than they were when I was a kid because I was raised in the street life and I migrated prison to the street life. Street life always changes. Street life now is nowhere it was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. The dynamics of street life change just like the dynamics in a correctional facility. Yeah. So Barbara sits down with Sheriff Nolan, Captain Maples um, for a debriefing, and she comes in there with a list. She has a lot to say. She's very direct and straightforward. Major Beard, how did you react to some of the things that she was saying? You know, being in charge of the jail, it was upsetting. You know, I had a great day yesterday. A lot of things were falling into place. And uh, I left the jail feeling good, and then, then Barbara's comments, it, it hurt me. I gotta be honest, it hurt me. Uh, what was it, what, what did she say that was most kind of concerning to you? You're not in control. The inmates are in control. Mm -hmm. If you work in a correctional facility and a statement like that's made, it hurts. Mm -hmm. Um, she also made a comment about some of the correction staff flirting with the women. Is that something that's come up before, um, and how do you address something like that? Let me tell you, Miss Elizabeth, it always comes up because we're, and I always tell the staff, we're not hanging uh, dashboards at the Ford Motor Company. We're actually working with human beings. And when you work with human beings, emotions get up. It, you, you can't let that happen, but does it happen? Yes. And when we know about it, we address it. What did you think of what Barbara had to say and um, some of the things that she said, like the inmates are in control? Did you see that in watching the show? Um, I think that, that with any correctional facility, there's a balance. Um, I think that the correction officers should be in charge. But there's always going to be some power wielded by the inmates. And the correction officers kind of need cooperation from the inmates in order for that facility to run um, <clears throat> semi uh, peacefully. Mm -hmm. One thing I did like about Barbara is that in her debriefing, what changed the most about her is she was able to humanize these people. You know, at the very beginning, she argued, you know, these are just bad people and they get all these benefits and they're treated so well. And I think at the end, she really started to view them as people, which is probably 
probably what the public lacks the most is the ability to view inmates as not animals but as human beings. She even said that she might want to be a corrections officer. Do you think she could make it? I'd have to I'd have to observe her for about three months just because mm -hmm. you spend sixty days in jail. Um, when you're a corrections officer, you gotta. She just had to balance corrections life. She was incarcerated twenty four seven. You got, we as corrections officer has to balance that. We have to balance our family. And there's a dynamic to it of having a bad day in jail and going home and facing your wife or your children. You know, I've had bad days in this job and uh, it probably cost me my marriage because I couldn't disconnect from it. Um, I'll ask you more about that later, actually, a uh, qu uh, question from Twitter. But another question from Twitter. Um, so we saw an inmate, DeAndre, who we're kind of familiar with now, openly offer to engage in sexual activity with some of the other inmates. At Haley Jackie on Twitter asks, what happens if an inmate is caught doing sexual acts while also trading food and e-cigarettes for those sexual acts? He went to segregation. And in fact, what we didn't show, we, we uh, defused it all the way by sending to another county. Because we have other counties uh, that partner with us uh, we hold their problem children, they hold ours. So we have an opportunity to, to diffuse that for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, give him another uh, scene, another place to be. These, these people, uh, like I was telling you before the show, that kind of activity causes chaos. It really does. Uh, you get people involved, you get, you get items involved. Uh, I don't care what kind of sexual act it is, uh, emotions get involved, so it causes chaos in a correctional facility. I also think that um, what that highlighted, and I'm, I'm actually kind of glad that it, that some type of sexual activity was shown because it, it does cause major issues along with safety issues. Uh, it causes health issues, right? That's why we have such high rates of HIV uh, um, in correctional facilities. But also, the other gentleman who was trying to pimp out DeAndre, I forget his name, he represents something that we don't discuss about corrections often. There is an active sex trade, and there are inmates who are literally sold to other inmates as though, I mean, just like you would have human trafficking outside, mm -hmm. you have it inside of facilities. And it becomes difficult, especially when you bring prison gangs into the mix, because a prison gang will own inmates, will physically own them, and will sell them for a candy bar. And even if you take them and you move them into a different unit, that gang sells that inmate to this other gang and that inmate continues to be sold throughout the facility and it becomes really difficult to actually address that problem. And sexual violence within prisons has such a lasting of effect on the individual beyond when they're released that I'm actually glad that the show showed that yeah. because it's an issue that we like to pretend doesn't exist. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. Back when I first started in corrections, you see one inmate tell another inmate, "Put your hand, your hand, your hand in my pocket. You're my, you're mm -hmm. mine now. You're my property." And what happens is, it, it used to start by somebody coming in without any money. You need a soup. You need, you need some honey buns. You need this. And unknowing, this inmate, yeah, he takes all this stuff. And two weeks later, this guy's like. What are you going to give me for that stuff I gave you? Do you think, is that kind of thing more common in a prison facility than a jail? Or do you see it often? I, I, I try not to see it in jail, but it does happen, like Ms. Ortiz says. It does happen. We, we keep a sharp eye on that stuff. Uh, it probably happens more in a prison because a prison's more spread out. You know, the county jail is on a city block. There's acres and acres at a prison. Could someone be criminally charged for taking part? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So my understanding was that a inmate or inmates complained about DeAndre and that's why correction staff took him out. Yes. Um, so when inmates have complaints or grievances, how do they get that to staff? Well, they can, uh, they can address it through a kite, like they called it, or we got a kiosk, but the kiosk grievance system, you could have somebody looking over your shoulder. With a kite, you can get by yourself, write something down, a uh, corrections officer comes in, makes his round, just slide it to him, like at lockdown at night. Uh, so I, we get letters all the time like that. Hey, this is doing that. 
and it's always anonymous. It has no signature to it, but you still, this guy's running the pod, this guy's doing this, this girl's doing this, and we have to take all that stuff serious. So then what would be the process of, because DeAndre, when he's put in segregation in the episode, he says that he has no idea why, and he's been asking why, and they won't tell him. What's the protocol and process for letting the accused We have what we call a segregation confinement report. It's, it's made in triplicates, and uh, it's got the inmate, the inmate's number, the housing assignment. It goes through what is suspended out of the inmates. He doesn't have access to the day room, only one hour a day. He doesn't get commissary, hygiene only. It's, we got a list, I should have brought one. If I knew this was gonna come up, I brought one. But it, a copy goes to the person in segregation, another copy goes to classification, another copy goes in his book and packet. So they are notified and DeAndre acts bewildered, but he knows why he's in it. Is there a, a time frame they have to be notified, they have to get that Within copy? Within 24 hours, yes ma'am. Gotcha. Okay, so something else that we see going on in the D pod that I believe came up earlier in the season two um, was that they uh, believe there is a cell phone and Zach's trying to find who has the cell phone. Um, tell me, Major Beard, how a cell phone can be used in that facility and, and how it's dangerous to you all. Cell phones are unmonitored contacts. Any, any phone call or email or anything that comes out of the jail on our system can be monitored. Cell phones sort of give inmates access to unmonitored phone calls, whether it be setting up a drug deal on the outside, setting up drug deals on the inside. Um, it's really bad if you have multiple cell phones in the jail because somebody in pod two can call pod 3D. Hey, this guy's coming over there. I want you to get him. Uh, this is what I'll pay you. So really it's, uh, it's undetected communication, which is bad in a correctional facility. How do they get the cell phones in there? Um, in body cavities, um, things like that. Or, and, and let me tell you something, and it's something that I, cell phones are traffic. You know, you get a corrections officer making X amount of dollars, which, and their light bill's not paid, and we're all humans, and this corrections officer will befriend the inmate maybe and say, man, I don't know what we're gonna do about our, the worst thing you can do is discuss your financial, because the inmates will get your money. Yeah, I'm actually working on a piece on this, uh, um, on cell phones, and um, a lot of the inmates I spoke with discussed correctional officers bring, bringing them in, but when a correctional officer isn't paid very well, that's a, you know, things become enticing to them. And the thing with a cell phone is that it is constant uh, money, because you can sell a cell phone for $500, but then you can sell the prepaid minutes on a continuous basis. So it's not a one time, it's not just bringing in drugs and those drugs are gone. It's a, it, it, it's a constant flow um, of money. So do you know if any correction staff recently has been found to be selling? No, selling not there? recently. It's happened. Mm -hmm. You know, it's happened in other facilities I work at. Mm -hmm. um, and it's back to uh, what Ms. Ortiz said is it's uh, financial, financial status. You know, and a lot of people say, how could they ever do that? Well, when you got a wife or a husband and four or five kids at home and you're not making ends meet, you know, the basic human instinct is survival. Now, would I ever do something like that? No, no. But you, you can't let these inmates in your personal circle mm -hmm. because once they're in that personal cir circle, it's like getting a fly in the ointment. What can you as jail commander, what kind of red flags can you keep an eye out for from correction staff that maybe they are doing? I keep, I keep an eye out on a lot of stuff. Uh, um, inmate Smith, all of a sudden I had a female, well, Joe this, and Joe, I had it happen to me in uh, Jennings County. It was, well, Denny this and Denny that by food service. I said, what is this Denny stuff? And you look for changes in personality, like you got a female, and I, I'm just giving an example because this has happened before. You get a female, that's plain Jane, and all of a sudden she's wearing enough makeup and, and putting stuff in her hair and, you know, because the inmates, they're cons. Miss Elizabeth, you sure look good today. I like that blouse you got on. It's really nice, you look really nice. And it just keeps on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And people that don't get much attention on the outside, feels good. 
Um, so eventually in the episode, uh, we see a corrections officer go into the cell. I can't remember why he goes into the cell. Um, we have a question from Twitter, and I saw this a, a few times. This is from at Karen7165. Why do they send only one CO into spot check at night? It should always be at least two COs going into a cell. I hope that CO is okay. What was your reaction to seeing one officer go into a cell and what well, looks like happened? Um, first of all, just like most facilities, Clark County is, it is very understaffed. Right, so you, um, a lot of times you don't have enough officers to do to, and you really should, but without the funding to hire more people, it becomes impossible. I think that officer was just making a regular round, and you know, given all the um, activity that we saw in the episode, he knew there was a cell phone, and he just so happens to hear the cell mm -hmm. phone ring or, or vibrate. And I think that's why he goes and actually enters a cell. I think, and I could be wrong, that he was more doing a check to see if something was going on, and then maybe they they would have called in everyone else, but then he heard the cell phone vibrate and maybe thought, let me right. get to it now. Right. Major Gary? In a situation where he, he went straight to the cell, did he not? He went straight to the cell. He wasn't making a check. He went up there for that cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a young officer. All of a sudden, you start seeing the glamour of, of finding contraband. I've been there and done that. You know, hey, there's some weed in this cell, and I want to be a cowboy. Most guys want to be a cowboy and don't think about the ramifications. But you've got to use your head in this. No, you know, you wouldn't go in the West End of Louisville in an ethnic environment by yourself and say, drop the dope. It just, you you got to call in reinforcement. You got to, we train that. You know, we do not, if there's a fight going on, you wait till backup gets there, you take notes. Now, if that cell phone's vibrating, you say, nobody move, and then you get on the radio. Do you think some corrections officers can make the mistake of being too trusting? Like maybe he went in that cell thinking there's no way that they're gonna jump me, I'm a corrections officer. I, you know, we've, we've watched Afron for weeks and weeks and weeks, and we know he's a character. We know he, he runs the show. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't, well, I'm not, I wouldn't trust somebody like that as far as I could talk. Right. And he was charged with attempted murder, yeah. so we know that there's potential of yeah. violent past here. Yeah. Um, so someone on Twitter also asked, why would someone want to become a correction, or correction officer? Um, I ask myself that all the time, <laughs> but but listen, uh, and me and the sergeant was discussing this before we, it's a passion. You know, anybody that comes to work in a jail for a paycheck don't last very long, but man, my first step on the prison yard, the feel of it, the structure of it, I looked up and said, God, this is it, ain't it? It's it. You know right away. Right. Either you now. 34 of us went out on the yard and them big metal doors clang. The next day, 12 people showed up. It's just not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And you gotta know you'll never be a millionaire being a correction mm -hmm. officer. Jennifer, how many of your students express interest in getting into corrections? Uh, surprisingly, um, quite a few. Mm -hmm. um, and then they take my correction class and then I'm not sure that they really understand, you know, what, what being part of corrections entails and then when I show them documentaries about, you know, inmates cutting themselves and, and fights and riots and all this stuff, then they're like, I'm not sure if I really want to do this. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not, cause I, I think most people don't know what, it, what inside of a prison looks like or what happens inside of a prison. So they think, oh yeah, I could do that. It's just like being a police officer. But it's nothing like being um, a police officer. You can be a police officer and work, in, and work, and work an eight-hour shift and never come face-to-face -face with a criminal. When you're a corrections officer, you're eight hours of nothing but that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they uh, they truly understand. Your adrenaline gets spiked more in a jail than it ever will on the street. I used to go to the theater and watch Dirty Harry movies where, you know, you walk around, shoot people, drink a couple beers, high five <laughs> with your buddies. Uh, I was a reserve when I come to Clark County. It's not like that. It's going to the same domestic, and it's like she said, you can you can work eight hours. There's people. People in the police departments work 20 years and never unholstered their weapon. But in corrections, you always got to be prepared because it can go from zero to 60 as quick as you snap your fingers. Do you think this show has helped shed light on what it means to be in corrections? Yes. 
and, and you know that's that's the most important thing for me is the public's perception of oh they just go in there and smack people around and you know it's 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 a whole different dynamic than that always has been always will be you, you can't wear your feelings on your sleeve being a corrections officer yeah. i want to flash back to last week for a minute um, since we didn't get to meet uh, Robert leaves the show finally and has his debriefing um, and it seems like his views have not changed. He actually said it was easier than I thought it would be. How did you react to to Robert? He's a moron. He, he was doing this for self-glory and if he was in here and Robert if you're listening you're a moron. <laughs> uh, it was just uh, it was really a wasted space you know, this this uh, show was, we were really looking for information. We were really looking for intel. It's the best shot we had at it. And it's been, to me, it's been a success. But Robert, it was just a waste of time. Jennifer, what did you make of it? I watched that debriefing and I literally felt so angry mm. watching it. Like I couldn't control myself. And I told my husband, I was like, thank God that I wasn't in that room because I couldn't have done what Captain Maples and what Sheriff Noel did to, I couldn't have kept, kept my composure because mm -hmm. to me, he was just blatantly disrespectful. Mm -hmm. um, for him to yawn in their faces and to just laugh at, laugh at things they were saying, I can't imagine disrespecting either of those men that way ever. Um, and another thing was, I took it quite personally because someone very close to me served seven years in a correctional facility at the age of 17 for a nonviolent drug offense. And that person was sexually and physically abused for years. And that person is almost 40 years old and still suffers from the trauma and nightmares of that experience. And for him to sit there and act as though being incarcerated is just a joke, like it's funny, really bothered me because how can you call yourself a teacher and sit there and say things like that when what you're basically telling kids is, it's okay, go commit crime, jail's not a big deal. And that really bothered me because what happens to people when they're incarcerated to me is extremely terrible. Um, and you have a lot of nonviolent people go in and they come out violent because of trauma and things that they experience. And I was just like, I hope I never cross paths with him because I went from he's annoying to I really cannot stand this person. So you did some exit interviews, but did you not interview Robert? No. Okay. Um, and there is a reason for everything because <laughs> I there's no way I could have sat in that room and dealt with that. Yeah. All right, so looking ahead to next week, which is the finale, Major Beard, what are you looking forward to? What are you hoping to see? I think we got two pretty important exit interviews coming up. Number one, Zach, who seems to have a level head, seems to be very intelligent, military guy, and Tammy, who's a police officer who struggled uh, more than Barbara, and who could imagine that when this started? You know, so the two exit interviews by them will be very intriguing to me for me to watch. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? I'm actually looking forward to the to the same exact thing. I'm really interested to hear what Zach has to say because he's been able to keep his composure the entire time and kind of sit back and observe. And then Tammy's had the exact opposite. She's been involved in everything, in every drama and in every issue. So it'll be interesting to see just how different um, their perspectives are. Yep. All right, well that episode, the finale episode, airs Thursday at 10 p.m. on A&E. And that's it for this episode of Inside 60 Days. For more of our 60 Days in coverage, go to newsandtribune.com slash inside 60 days. To ask our panelists your own questions, tweet at News and Tribune with the hashtag inside 60 days. And thank you again to our panelists and to the Jeffersonville High School students behind the cameras who help us every week. And thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.